Good evening, everyone, and welcome to my presentation entitled My Falklands War, 40 Years On. The reason I'm making it in my office at this moment is because last night I gave this presentation for the first time to a live audience, but forgot to record it. So here goes second time round. So if you were to ask me uh, what I was doing two weeks ago, uh, without looking at my calendar, I would have no idea whatsoever. However, I do know exactly where I was 40 years ago today. And that was on this, this wonderful ship, the Canberra, sailing south as part of the task force, result, uh, reacting to the Argentinians invading the Falkland Islands. At the time, I was a captain in the parachute regiment. I was second in command of B Company in three para, and we were based at Tidworth. Our normal role was what is called SPE, Services Protected Evacuation. For those of you old enough to remember, the Israelis uh, performed a raid on Entebbe Airport in 1976 to rescue some uh, Israeli hostages. Um, but if you're not that old, the more recent one was when two para evacuated loads of civilians from Afghanistan at the end of the Afghanistan war. However, from the middle of March 1982 until allegedly the middle of April 1982, three para were on spearhead duty. And what that meant was we had to be ready to deploy anywhere in the world within 24 hours. The last week of March uh, 1982, I started a 10 week course at the School of Infantry in Warminster, and it was during the first week of that course that the Argentinians invaded. When the course broke up on Friday evening for the weekend, I phoned my boss and said, do I need to come back to barracks? Are we being deployed? And he said, no, you go away and enjoy your weekend. We're not going to be deployed. So at the time I was engaged to Sue, my nine now wife, and I went down there for the weekend. Uh, we went out for a pub lunch on Saturday afternoon came back to her flat and uh, settled down to watch the Grand National. And then there was an enormous bang, banging on the flat door. And I think we both knew what that meant. I went and opened it and standing there was a, a big old policeman. He said, I'm looking for Captain Logman. I said, that's me. I said, uh, he said, sorry, he said, I have a code word for you. I said, go ahead. He told me the code word and I said, thank you very much. He then said, does that mean what I think it means? And I said, yes, it does. And he said, well, good luck, son. And I thought, oh, we've got the nation behind us. So and I jumped in the car, drove as fast as we could back to barracks and got stopped by the South Wales police on the M4. Asked me if I knew what speed I was doing, you know, the usual routine when you got caught speeding. I explained who I was. I gave him my ID card. I told him the code word and uh, he went back to his car and made a few phone calls. It seemed an enormously long time, uh, but it was probably 10 minutes. He came back and he said, it seems like your story is true, so you better be on your way. But thank, uh, think yourself lucky. We don't breathalyze you. I thought, oh, well, maybe not all of the nation are behind us at this time. And interestingly, we were still receiving mail when we landed on the Falklands. And the last two letters I got were a bank statement and a letter from the chief constable of the South Wales police saying, under the circumstances, we've decided not to prosecute. So here's the camera. If you look in the middle, you can see the tail of a helicopter sticking out. You see the front, you can see an actual full, full picture of a helicopter on a landing pad there. And if you look around the middle of the ship where the lifeboats are hanging, you can see what was a promenade deck which went all the way round. We got back to, I got back to, uh, to Tidworth, to Barracks on the Saturday night, uh, only to be told that we were, had to be ready to deploy on the Sunday. So we had a party on the Saturday night. On the Sunday, we were told to be ready to deploy on the Monday. So we had a party on the Sunday night. 
And this went on until Thursday. And we did deploy on the Thursday. We were taken by bus down to Southampton and embarked upon the Canberra. We didn't leave until the Friday. So during the day, we had permission to go to go ashore. And I got a, an opportunity to speak to my mum and dad and Sue uh, for the last time before we deployed. And then we sailed out of Southampton as the sun was going down and everybody was told uh, to stand on deck. And it was a magnificent sight sailing out of Southampton, all the lights flashing, people cheering. Uh, but there was also a serious part about it, which was some of us were not going to uh, get back and see England ever again. And we took with us some uh, workmen called dockyard mates who were responsible for making the changes to the camera. And this is some of them uh, making the uh, helicopter landing pad in the middle of Canberra. They had to do a good job because for them to get off the Canberra, helicopters had to land and take them to Gibraltar. So that must be the ultimate test of their workmanship. Um, we were allocated different parts of the... Excuse me while I change the slide. We were allocated different parts of the ship at different times of the day. So my responsibility was to write the daily training plan. We took out or performed lots of practical and uh, classroom training. And what you see here is soldiers in pairs. One is lying down, pretending to be sort of folding the ground, and the ones behind them are performing weapons drills to keep their weapons uh, uh, working. And wherever you deploy as a, as a soldier, there are two key attributes you need to have. One is you need to be able to shoot, and the other one is you need to be very fit. And so this is a practicing weapon drills. And I told you earlier on about the promenade deck. We were allocated that at various times during the day, and we ran round it as a unit for an hour at a time. Um, as you can imagine, on the Canberra, with two commando units and one parachute regiment battalion, there was a lot of rivalry. And uh, one way that manifested itself was that we'd got some newspapers on board and the front pages contained photographs of the Marines surrendering on the Falklands with their hands up. And so um, whenever we were running around the promenade deck, if a Marine appeared, somebody would shout, Marine on deck, and we'd carry on running around, but with our hands up like this, pretending to surrender. Uh, after a while of that, uh, we didn't uh, see many Marines coming up onto the promenade deck. Surprise, surprise. We were from Southampton, we were also followed by a number of trawlers, in inverted commas, uh, Russian spy ships, basically. And we had no, uh, we were in no doubt that they were passing on information in terms of our whereabouts and the constitution of the task force uh, back to the Argentinians. The trawlers stopped as we got further south. And what that meant was that we could actually shoot our weapons off the back of the boat. Um, but the Russians were still passing on intelligence to the Argentinians because every day we were overflown by uh, Russian spy aircraft flying from Angola in West Africa to Cuba and back. And so uh, what you see here is a couple of guys shooting GPMG, the general purpose machine gun, off the back of the boat. It's a belt-fed uh, machine gun. And we had to do this, well, we're pleased to do this, because you can get what's called gun shy, which is you're almost frightened at firing your gun. And so this was this was good for the guys. And I will say that uh, life on board the Canberra was pretty good. Um, it was stocked as a cruise ship, so there's plenty of uh, fine food on board. And in the evenings, we the officers were treated to silver service meals with beer and wine and it was fully stocked. And obviously we were uh, conscious that we didn't want those supplies to fall into the hands of the enemy at any point. So we conscientiously drunk as much beer and wine as we could almost every evening. Anyway, after 4,200 miles, I think it is, we ended up here, which is the Ascension Island. So called because it's risen up from the sea, it's volcanic rock, uh, in the middle there, in the clouds, 
at the top of that mountain, apparently there is a spectacular garden because the uh, microclimate there supports all sorts of uh, exotic plants. I never went up, but I know some people who did, and they said it was very, very impressive. Um, in the foreground, you can see these heaps of, of ash here, and they made me very nostalgic for the slag heaps of my uh, hometown back in South Yorkshire. Um, I apologize for the quality of this photograph, but this is me on the left, and my boss, Major Mike, argue on the right. And in the, in the background, you can see how the island slopes away, and that's where the airport was, called Wide Awake. Obviously, somebody with a sense of humor, because I think they had, under normal circumstances, very few flights per week. And at one stage, I'm told, it was the busiest airport in the world. Um, we went to shore on numerous occasions, practicing certain things. And one of the things that we did practice was uh, capturing the airfield. It was thought at one point that that might be our task to uh, capture Stanley Airport. Um, but we realized after attempting it two or three times from here that it wouldn't be a viable proposition. We couldn't get enough people in the helicopters to get us on the ground to have a decent fighting force to give us a chance uh, to do it. And as I said, we went ashore a number of times. This is uh, some of the lads going ashore on a uh, landing craft. And these are exactly the same as you've seen on films of D-Day and Saving Private Ryan. They're just flat bottomed, the engines at the back, the guy drives it as close as he can to, to the shore. And once he can't go any further, the front comes down and you all wade ashore, however deep the water may be or not. Um, you feel very vulnerable on one of these. I'm sure we'd have, uh, it would have been interesting going ashore into, uh, into the eyes of the enemy where we on these. And when we did go ashore, we did numerous things, uh, live firing, certain exercises, certain manoeuvres. Uh, but we also had a bit of fun. They gave us some afternoons off, and there are there is a beach there. And obviously, we could swim in the sea. One of the reasons I show you, well, there are three reasons why I show uh, this slide. Uh, the first one is, if you see the vehicle in the background there, uh, we had two troops of the Blues and Royals attached to us. And uh, this is their uh, company car, as you can call it. And this was very interesting to the guys. They were interested in getting in board and driving it and maybe firing, you know, the big machine gun off the front of there. The second reason is you can see two guys in the middle there, one pointing to us and the other one just smiling. Well, the guy smiling was at that time a 24-year-old uh, lieutenant who was a platoon commander in B Company. His name's John Shaw. Uh, he survived the Falklands, thankfully. Shortly afterwards, he went to uh, the SAS and passed their selection and rose through the ranks. One of his last posts was as the Director General of Special Forces UK, and he retired a few years ago in the rank of Major General. And the third reason for showing this uh, photo is if you look on the left, you can see someone just entering the photo, again, a, a sergeant carrying his rifle. And that's a photograph of Sergeant Ian Mackay, who went on to be posthumously awarded the VC in the Battle for Mount London. So, after quite a while uh, on the Ascension Island, uh, we realised that the diplomatic efforts were not going to succeed. Uh, we had access to the BBC World Service on the radio every day, and we heard all about uh, the Americans trying to broker a truce, et cetera, et cetera, uh, but they all came to naught. And so we had to, we then just sail south from somewhere in the middle of the South Atlantic, somewhere here, down to the Falkland Islands, which I hope you can see my cursor moving down the bottom right hand side of the tip of South America. And that's a, a trip of about 3,800 miles. Um, the mood changed somewhat on board ship. It now became quite serious and the weather got a lot worse. So sailing was, was not particularly pleasurable, whereas it had been before. And 
we all realise that we're going to have to uh, go and evict the Argentinians forcefully. So the plan was, and this is a, a map of the Falklands, East and West Falkland, with Stanley Ho over, over here, the black dot over on the right-hand side. And where we were going to land was here, up on the western side of East Falkland. And this is where the beachhead, this area here, were where the beachheads were established. With the plan being that the task force would sail in between the islands and we would go all go ashore by, by landing craft. Okay. So on the 20th of May, uh, we got our orders that on the morning of the 21st of May, before last light, we would be going ashore and our objective would be to capture Port San Carlos and occupy the high ground above it. The intelligence said that there was no Argentinians there, um, but we weren't all rely too confident, shall I say, in the uh, military intelligence. Um, we got all our kit ready. There's only so many times you can count your ammunition and clean your weapon. Uh, but we were also asked to do three things of an administrative nature. The uh, first one was to specify what your funeral arrangements were. Uh, I opted to be buried back in England, in my hometown of Wathon Dern, but there not to be any uh, firing of weapons, but there could be a military presence there. The second thing that we had to, were asked to do was to write a will, if we hadn't already done so. I think my estate at the time consisted of about £2,000 in the bank and an MGB roadster. And if I remember rightly, I left the money to my mum and dad and the car to sue my fiancée, now wife. The third thing we were asked to do was to write our last letter home. And uh, that was a very hard thing for me to do, trying to put into words, you know, the thoughts and feelings, you know, to, to sue my fiance and to my parents. And I know a lot of the, a lot of the blokes, including some of the officers, uh, simply couldn't do it. They just said that, that they believed that their loved ones uh, knew what they felt about them. And so that was what we were, we were asked to do. So on the morning of the 21st of May, over here on the left-hand side is Falkland Sound, the gap between the two islands, and where our unit three para, we went to shore here at Port San Carlos. Two para and the two commando units went to shore further south down here at Ajax Bay and San Carlos settlement, which is a little bit uh, confusing. Now, if you can see these strong black lines that cross the map here and here, um, that signifies that um, it's the joint of four maps. And I do have here my original map. So I'll come out of sharing my screen for a second. And this is the map that, that I took ashore with me with all the markings on of who was where and what. Okay. Now, if I were to unravel this map, which I won't because it's a little bit uh, a delicate, shall we say, you would see that actually where we went ashore was the joining of four maps. So a few weeks, sorry, yeah, a few weeks before we landed, um, we were given four maps and they reach about uh, eight foot by six foot. And we had to cut the borders off, put all four maps together, glue them together, cut them into a manageable size like this, and draw in all the grid lines. You won't be able to see this, but a lot of these grid lines here, you can see that, that I've written the numbers on, but also that they're drawn on in pencil. And so we had to actually create our own maps. So we landed in Port San Carlos on the western side here. There weren't any enemy, it was unopposed, and we made our way up to the high ground to the north and east of the settlement. Uh, this is a shot taken back towards where we landed. 
So in the distance, you can see some of the ships as part of the task force. And I believe the, the one that's shining quite brightly there, the white one, is the Canberra. If you look where the, the land meets the sea, you'll see some small figures. That's the some of the lads coming ashore. And if you look at the front, you will see what the terrain was like. It was very, very difficult terrain, terrain to, to walk on. The, it constituted of big tussocks of grass. And in between them, the earth was sort of peat. And you couldn't walk on the tussocks of grass. They weren't stable enough if you're carrying weight. So to make your way, you had to weave your feet in between the tussocks of grass and, and do it that way. Very, very difficult uh, walking. And I would say after 8,000 miles being on board a ship, those of us who aren't particularly uh, good uh, sailors were pleased to land, get back on once again, what Del Boy would say was terracotta. Bear with me a second. So the next five shots, are taken by a, a pocket camera that I had, which was completely legal. We weren't meant to take cameras ashore. Um, and they're taken from the company headquarters, in these rocks here, looking east all the way through to the west uh, via looking south. So you can see the terrain, yeah, quite barren. These are all tussocks of grass over in the top right-hand side and occasionally some rocks. And if you see the black marks here, this is where the guys were trying to dig in with trenches. However, it was very hard to dig down. You got about a foot down and then the place filled with water. So you could see we had to start building up and making best use of what cover we could. So there's a couple of guys here and you can see for their trench, they're actually built up and then covered it with earth. This is now looking south towards the river that we came in on. And again, you can see some of the lads here using the rocks for shelter. This is looking southwest. We've put San Carlos settlement down here. And then finally, this is looking sort of southwest again, out towards Falkland Sound. Um, for us at this stage, it was more survival than war. We hadn't engaged with the enemy. Uh, there was eight hours daylight and 16 hours night time when it was freezing, the wind was blowing, it was snowing, it was raining, it was hard work just to stay dry and warm. Um, we could only cook during the eight hours of daylight. So what we had to do was try and get as much hot food and drink into us as we could in that eight hours, because during the 16 hours of night time, uh, we couldn't have any, uh, any cooking going on. And we were feeling a little bit frustrated um, that we weren't uh, engaging with the enemy at this time, despite the fact that there was a war going on around us. The Argentinian Air Force seemed to be obsessed with sinking the ships, despite the fact that the majority of uh, troops were ashore. And so what they would do uh, every day was fly down Falkland Sound, down towards where two para and the commando units were, and then banked left and left again, and fly down this river from left to right as we're looking at it towards the ships back in the Falkland Sound and have two goes at them. And every day, you know, on a regular basis, over our radio, we would hear air attack red, which meant the Argentinians were attacking. And we were meant to take cover, uh, but, but didn't. You know, we wanted to see the spectacle and I saw a number of aircraft being shot out of the sky and some of them flow, flew directly above us, you know, uh, but never decided to bomb or strafe us. If they had done, I think the, uh, you know, it would have been disastrous for us. While this was happening, someone had a, a good idea to place one of the uh, general purpose machine guns on the rocks in the bottom right-hand corner of the, of the shot here. And the idea was that if you're out in the open and if you saw an Argentinian aircraft, you should grab the uh, machine gun and, and shoot at it, see if you could bring it down. Well, what happened, of course, was the guys were 
in their shelters, cooking, sleeping, getting some rest, doing what you do to stay alive. But when Air Attack Red was announced, it would be a massive scramble to get up onto these rocks and be first to get hold of this the machine gun and have a pop at the, uh, the Argentinians. So we knew if, if we wanted to find out where everybody was, we'd just make a pretend announcement of Air Attack Red and we, everybody would emerge. And some of the guys shot at some of the Argentinian aircraft. Made no dent whatsoever in their Air Force power, but uh, we loosed off a lot of rounds and it seemed to be uh, good for morale. So, we were then given orders to make a tactical advance east towards Port Stanley. The expression that became common was a, a Royal Marine expression, which is called yomping. I've no idea what it stands for, but in the parachute regiment, we tab. That is the tactical advance to battle. And so this is, we were then given orders to make a move. The 27th of May, we were told to go and secure a place called Teal Inlet. Uh, we had to cover 45 kilometers over the most demanding of terrain, which I've told you about in, in awful weather, rain, sleet, and snow. We were carrying what I say is only ammunition, first aid kit, and food for 24 hours. Um, by only, I mean, for example, I had a machine gun, uh, five magazines of uh, ammunition, four hand grenades, a belt of ammunition for the uh, general purpose machine gun, and a small 66 millimeter caliber anti-tank uh, weapon. Had our first aid kit and some additional first aid materials and a ration pack for 24 hours. What it meant was that we weren't carrying our Bergens, in which we, there would be sleeping bags, ponchos for shelter, spare, food, spare clothing, spare food, all those sorts of things. And the Royal Marines have a, an expression which is a uh, travel light, freeze at night, and they're absolutely right. We traveled light um, and we did freeze. We were moving at night, which wasn't too bad. But when we laid up during the day, it was very difficult. We couldn't cook during the day. We couldn't cook during the night when we were traveling. And so it was just cold food and, uh, and no form of shelter. Quite, quite arduous. However, we were tasked with getting there in 72 hours and we made it in under 36. So that was the, the premium, I suppose, for traveling light. So we came to Teal Inlet and uh, we arrived just after midnight. There's no sign of life in any of the buildings. And my company, B Company, we were allocated these buildings, told to get inside, take shelter for the night, get some hot food, get some sleep. And the next day we would uh, re-evaluate what we're going to do. Um, there's no sign of life, so I volunteered to go forward, take three guys with me and try and get access to this large building here. I found the, the, the main door, banged on it, and no reply. And I banged on it again, and there was no reply. And then I was in a bit of a quandary. So what do I do? Do I sort of barge it open and maybe it's, it's locked and bolted and I'll just end up flat on my backside? Do I actually open it in the normal circumstances, turning the handle? And the danger being that either it was booby trapped or there were some Argentinians just behind the door waiting to, to, to ambush us. Or thirdly, do we sort of blow the doors off, you know, in Michael Caine style? And while I was pondering this quandary, uh, the door opened and a young boy in his teens with blonde hair opened the door very gingerly and, and peeked his head around the corner. The only sound I heard was, was safety catches being slipped because we thought this could be the enemy and the beginning of a firefight. The young lad said to me, and I was the only one who could see him, uh, because hiding behind the door, he said to me something in quite poor Spanish. So I realized that he wasn't uh, an Argentinian, wasn't armed. And so I said to the guys, hold your fire. 
Then I said to the young lad, it's okay, we're British paratroopers. And the first thing he said was, Mom! He called his mum. She came dashing to the door, gave me a big hug, recoiled because I was dirty and cold and smelly, uh, but invited us in, obviously, and we got a good night's sleep, shelter, warmed up, dried out in these buildings here. Um, because we got there in 36 hours, we thought instead of 72, we thought, OK, we're going to have it cushy here for a, for a day or two while the rest of them catch up. And, uh, and this would be nice and cosy. But uh, sadly, that wasn't the case to be. We spent uh, 36 hours in Teal Inlet, just regrouping, getting ourselves together. And then we were given a second objective, which was Estancia House. This was 30 kilometers, a little bit shorter distance, but over similar terrain and the weather was getting worse. We were getting into the Falkland Islands winter. And we did lose some soldiers uh, along the way with exhaustion, exposure, injuries from twisting their knees or ankles walking along or even trench foot. They weren't uh, as conscientious as looking after their feet as they should have been. And we arrived there on the 31st of May, and then on the 1st of June, we moved up into the hills above uh, Estancia House, into Mount Estancia, and we waited. And this is Estancia House itself. Now, uh, I know there's some people in the audience last night who would have interest in things like uh, mental toughness, uh, resilience, winning attitude, motivation. So I thought I'd uh, capture my ideas in terms of what kept me going. And then I allowed the audience to ask questions. So what kept me going? Uh, the first thing was pride. Uh, pride in the fact that I was in the parachute regiment. I wear, this, I wear this polo shirt with pride. Last night I wore my regimental tie with pride. Passing selection for the Paris was the hardest thing physically I've ever done by a long, long way. But it allowed me to join a regiment that is, relatively speaking, young, only formed in the Second World War, but has a very long tradition of which they are very, very proud. Starting way back when in the Second World War with Arnhem, for example. And on the way down, we were getting messages from current and former paras telling us about the tradition and that we had to uphold and they had every confidence in us. So it made us all think, well, we've got, a, we've got something to, to prove here that this generation can do what the previous ones did. The second reason was responsibility. I was a commissioned officer. I couldn't pack it in. People were looking to me for leadership. And so that responsibility sat with me. The third thing was team spirit. Uh, I'd always played team sports during my life, uh, thoroughly enjoyed them. The esprit de corps, as it's called, that you get, the camaraderie you get from being part of a team is very strong. And we were losing people, as I've said, and this just, in my mind, made it uh, more dangerous for us, those of us who were left, to perform any uh, task or mission that we would eventually have to do. And then the final one is a sense of injustice. Um, the injustice that the Argentinians had invaded something that, in my opinion, had, they had no right to, and I think we needed to correct that. So at this stage last night, uh, I asked for, if there are any questions, and we took a very short break. I'll have another drink of my red wine, if I may, and then we'll move on. So, the attack on Mount Longdon. We'd been surviving on Mount Estancia for 10 days by now. And on the morning of the 11th of June, we were given orders that that night at midnight, three para would be the first unit from the task force to launch an attack on the hills 
around Port Stanley. It was to be a silent attack. In other words, there was no preliminary bombardment by aircraft or artillery. Um, what it meant was we were meant to sneak up on them, uh, you know, and say, boo. And B Company, company of which I was second in command, we would lead the attack. And uh, there's a quote from Mike Tyson, I think it is, who said, everybody has a plan until you get hit in the face. These are the words from a book that I'll talk to you about in a moment, but I'll give you the opportunity to just read these words and let them sink in. We didn't know what to expect. We'd had people on Mount Longdon assessing the number of uh, Argentinian soldiers and uh, their uh, equipment, what weapons they had, where they were, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what we didn't know about them, and in many respects, what we didn't know about ourselves, was how we were going to perform uh, in the stresses of battle. So what resulted was very, very close hand-to-hand -hand fighting, very bloody on both sides with terrible injuries and deaths, I'm afraid to say. These words are taken from a book, which I'll explain more later. It's called Three Days in June. The author is a guy called James O'Connell, and I'll talk to you about Jimmy and the book later. And just to make things uh, nice and cosy, the temperature was, with the wind chill factor, was minus 15. Interestingly, I can't remember it being that cold. I think we all had other things on our minds at the time. Um, over here, sort of two thirds of the way up and on the left-hand side, the dark mountain there, that's Mount Longdon. And this is the view that we'd, we had had of it for about the last 10 days. The plan, and there's also a plan, as you know, was as follows. If you can ignore these two guys in the, in the foreground and look to the top and far away, you will see a river meandering its way along. And the plan was that we would uh, muster north of the river, the area up here, cross the river, make our way across this terrain here, and then attack the mountain from the eastern edge. Now, the river. We'd crossed several rivers in our tab across the island, and we got wet through and freezing cold and wet boots and so on and so forth. And whether we crossed several rivers or one river several times, I'm not too sure, uh, but it was crystal clear that we didn't want to cross another one but we didn't have much of an option until somebody had the great idea that if we borrowed a ladder from Estancia House, we could all cross the river one by one over this ladder. And sure enough, we had this uh, aluminium ladder, probably like that you and I have got in the garden. And uh, we went across it one by one in pitch dark, and hoping to maintain silence. I got across it okay, thankfully, but I did hear people falling into the river and being dragged out. Um, we then mustered as a company this side of the river here and made our way across this land here. And we were making decent progress silently, nothing from the Argentinians, until sadly the corporal at the very front of the, of the whole attack uh, stood on a mine, he was blown up and sadly lost his leg. He wasn't killed, but he was in a great, great deal of pain. Uh, we got the medics forward to him, uh, but in the meantime, the Argentinians started to put up flares to see what was happening. The drill, when that happens, when you're mounting an attack and the enemy put up flares, is to stand perfectly still and close one eye. 
The rationale behind this is you've still got one eye open to see what's going on. But the other one, when you open it again, you've not lost your night vision. And I suppose quite bizarrely, I still do this when cars are driving towards me at night with their full beam on. I don't know whether it makes any difference or not, but I still do it automatically. Shortly after the flares going up, the Argentinians obviously could see what was happening. So they uh, started to machine gun us from Mount London. And obviously the drill in those circumstances is to take cover, hit the ground and try and make yourself as small a target as possible. But we all realized at the time that we were taking cover, falling to the ground uh, in a minefield. And we could have easily have all been blown up, you know, if the minefield had been, had been effective. Thankfully, it wasn't, nobody else got injured by a mine, either taking cover or when the rest of us walked across it. But I must say, you know, when it all stopped, getting the order to stand up and advance was terrifying. But in between that, the machine gunning was also terrifying. High at the ground, but I just looked up and I suppose about six foot above me, I could see rounds whizzing past, see the little red rounds, which are tracer. And if the Argentinians are anything like us, then in between each tracer, they put three, four, or sometimes five rounds. And I was seeing these things whizzing past, and I knew full well that there was three, four, or five rounds in between each of them. And uh, none of us at the front in B Company got hit, but people behind us who just got over the river, some of those guys did get hit, I'm afraid. So. The machine gunning stopped, the flares stopped. We captured our, we got, we got our sensors back and then the order was to stand up and advance. And this is a photograph of Mount Longdon taken a few years, a few, a few days later, pick upon, uh, from an aircraft. And we advanced from the bottom left and we split into two groups. Two of the platoons followed the northern side, which as you can see is the one we're looking at. And you can see a footpath there, which then turns sharp right, goes onto the top of the mountain. The other platoon came all the way around the back of the mountain and progressed along the southern side. We made a lot of good progress. We did engage with the enemy, you know, there was shots exchanged, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it became quite heavy. We were probably 30 meters away at times from the enemy. Um, and we did capture some of them. I remember in, we caught a young Argentinian soldier and because of my basic Spanish, I tried to interrogate him and got very frustrated when he answered my questions faster than I could ask them. I would say, Quantos soldados I, which is how many soldiers are there. And he was telling me before I'd finished, finished the sentence, the question. Um, we did make good ground about halfway along. And then we started to come under heavy resistance and we were taking a lot of casualties. Um, within the battalion of 600 and odd men, we had 10 17 year olds who shouldn't have been there and we had 42 18 year olds and as we were taking casualties uh, as part of the attack i remember seeing the body of one 17 year old and the body of one lad who was 18 on the 11th of june and had died in the early hours of the 12th of june so by then we had established a regimental aid post on the right-hand side of the mountain as we're looking at it now. And that is where the medics and the doctors are. And I was trying to get as many of the wounded back from the front to get the medical um, help. And the, the battle was in well, full flight now, very noisy, chaotic, lots of things happening. Uh, but we seem to stall. We seem to not be making you know, the progress that we had done initially, probably because we were taking casualties, maybe the Argentinians were, were starting to put up a stiff fight. And 
I came back with some some casualties back to the regimental aid post once, and in a small cave, just on the right hand side of this photograph, I could see a, a dim light, and I thought, I wonder what's happening there. So I went over to investigate and came across a Royal Artillery officer I knew called Willie McCracken. Uh, we'd met on the Canberra, sailing south. He was a really good guy. And he was there that night uh, coordinating the artillery uh, that was being uh, brought down upon the Argentinians and, and us. And he said, how's it going, Adrian? I said, we're, we're slowing down, we're stalling, Willie. You know, we're, we're taking casualties. They're putting up a fierce fight. And, you know, we don't seem to be making much progress at the moment, having made some initially good progress. He said, yep. Yeah. He said, that's what I've heard on the radio. And he says, that's why uh, I've been tasked with bringing down naval gunfire onto Mount Longdon. I said, all oh, right. I said, uh, where are the boats, ships, as a matter of interest, Willie? He saw they sailed round and they're off the coast of, of Port Stanley about 20 miles out. I thought, all oh, right. I said, and what are the waves at the present time? He said, oh, they're about 40 foot high. So I then said, so we've got ships 20 miles away. We're going to shell us and they're sailing in 40 foot high waves. Roughly speaking, what level of accuracy will they be bringing to their shelling of Mount Longdon? And he said, oh, plus or minus a kilometer. And I said, you know, we're only about 30 meters away from the Willie. He says, I know, but that's, we're going to give it a try. So next time I went up to the front, there were some enormous bangs. And some of the guys asked me, what was that? And I told them, and I think they were similarly unimpressed as, as I was with, with this option that had been taken. I don't think it had any effect whatsoever. So as the night wore on, we were taking more casualties and a couple of them had got leg injuries. And if you look to the bottom left of the screen here, you can see some rocks jutting up and we got a couple of guys with leg injuries there and I brought uh, two stretcher bearer parties forward and while the stretcher bearers were sorting themselves out uh, I was stood talking to a corporal called Lovett who joined us and he was uh, giving people medical attention then all of a sudden there was a, an almighty boom I felt myself knocked to my knocked onto the ground, onto my back. For a while, I lost all my hearing. It was just buzzing. But I could feel an enormous pain in my, in my left hand. My hearing returned. And while that was happening, I lifted up my left arm with my right arm because it was increasingly becoming uh, painful and I couldn't feel it. And I pulled off my combat glove as I held my hand up to the, to the sky thinking that maybe I'd lost my hand. But to my delight, as you can see, my hand was still there, but my left wrist was swelling. I'd been hit by, uh, by shrapnel. What had happened was the Argentinians had seen us uh, collecting in this particular part of the mountain and had fired a, a handheld rocket at us. It had missed us, but it hit the rocks behind us to our left and exploded, and the explosion had come backwards towards us. Corporal Lovett was uh, stood on my left, and as we were coming round, people asked me how I was. I said, I've been hitting the arm, but I'm, I'm reasonably okay. They asked how Corporal Lovett was. I turned round, and I could see that he was he was dead. He'd taken the, the bulk of the blast from this rocket, and in many respects, I suppose, sheltered me, not knowingly, but that's what had happened. So by now, uh, I myself was a casualty. My, my left arm was becoming increasingly useless. Excuse me a second. So I was taken back, made my way back to the, to the regimental aid post and was then taken by helicopter during the daylight back to Teal Inlet. And this place was now a field hospital. I'm glad we'd not done a Michael Caine and blown the doors off. It was still intact. And uh, there I had an operation later that day on my left wrist to uh, relieve the pressure. And whilst I was uh, 
under the effect of the anaesthetic, uh, was flown by helicopter to the SS Uganda, which was a naval ship which was just out at sea. They then followed uh, my trip home. Um, I had a second operation on my wrist on the Uganda, and I actually got to phone home. My parents had received the dreaded telegram. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Logan, we regret to inform you that your son, Captain Logan, has been wounded in action. We have no further information, blah, 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 blah. And I think it wasn't until I became a parent that I realized the effect that this must have had on my parents to have me 8,000 miles away uh, fighting in a war where we, there wasn't particularly good communications, there was no internet, et cetera, et cetera, in those days, and to receive this, this telegram. So I found out that uh, we were allowed a three minute phone call to a UK number uh, once a week. And so I think it was on the Friday, I actually got to speak to my parents and ask them to pass on the news to, to Sue. Uh, from there, we went, uh, we spent, those of us who could walk, were on HMS Heckler from the Falklands to Montevideo. HMS Heckler, uh, under its normal guise, was a naval survey ship, very small, um, but they put a red cross on it and converted it into a ship that was ferrying people from the Falklands to Montevideo. And another memento I have here is a photograph of HMS Heckler. And in the bottom corner down here, I'll read it to you. It says, Adrian Logan, with best wishes for a speedy recovery, Jeff Hope, Captain RN, HMS Heckler, 25th of June, 1982. Um, those 10 days were, were enjoyable. Uh, we were amongst naval officers who were uh, good fun, shall we say, um, but it was painfully slow. I wanted to get home. It did 10 knots, the heckler, and, and, and it was a bit frustrating, I must admit. When we got to Montevideo, uh, we were escorted by uh, Uruguayan military from the port to the airport. And from there, we were flown by RAF VC-10 back to the Ascension Island and then on to RAF Lynham. From Lynham, we were taken to RAF Roughton, assessed, and I was then discharged from there on medical leave until three para uh, returned home. Uh, by this time, I'd grown a big bushy moustache. I'd lost about two stone in weight from my slim weight then. And um, I was look, walking down a corridor looking for mum and dad and Sue. And my mother recognised me by the way I walked. I'd uh, probably changed uh, that much. What I'd like to do now is say a few words about this guy. Uh, Jimmy O'Connell is the guy who wrote this book, Three Days in June. And if you look at his polo shirt, uh, similar to mine, but he's got one that says Three Days in June across the top. Then it's got the parachute regiment emblem. At the bottom, it says Mount Longdon. And then you can see the three in Roman numerals for three para. And that's on a green backing because green was the drop zone flash that we'd wear on our right arm to uh, show which unit we were from. And this is, uh, this is Jimmy O'Connell. He was a private that night uh, on Mount Longdon. He decided to write a book about his experiences, not sorry, not his experiences, our experiences. So he tracked down 148 people who were involved that night including me. So he's actually sat in this office here with me, going through my mementos, photos and everything. And the output of that were, was this book, Three Days in June. If you're interested in what I've been saying this evening, read it, it's riveting. And there's some quotes from me in there. Um, what happened to Jimmy? Why, why does he look like this? So he had a pretty horrific experience of Mount London. He survived, obviously, uh, was discharged from the army, went
went back to his home city of Liverpool and successfully set up a taxi business. And if life hadn't been cruel enough to him in terms of the injuries he'd suffered, in 2010, he was diagnosed with uh, cancer of the kidneys. He had a successful transplant, but COVID has rendered him immunosuppressed. And what the really, really cruel thing is, in my opinion, is that on the 18th of June, in Aldershot, there is a commemoration service and a reunion for 40 years of the Paris who served in the Falklands. And at this point, Jimmy won't be able to go, which, which is truly cruel. He's, he's done a massive, massive uh, service to the regiment, researching and reading this, and sadly, he won't be there. I'm still in touch with him via email and, and Twitter and things like that, and I really do wish that he could be with us, but I suspect he won't. Um, we're now going to move on to the aftermath and, and some personal perspectives. Um, last night was the first night I'd spoken publicly about uh, my uh, reactions afterwards. Um, when we got back, I was contacted by a Norwegian guy who was a researcher at, I think, the University of Lincoln, and he was looking into PTSS, post-traumatic stress syndrome as it was then, PTSD as it's known now. And we had a couple of conversations. I mentioned it to people back in the battalion and they said to me, don't talk to him or anybody about that sort of thing. It won't do you any good. So the attitude of the army back in 1982 was, was to deny stress and those sorts of things. Whereas nowadays it's far more acceptable and uh, rightly so. So I'll tell you about my experiences with this. But first of all, a quote from John Shaw, the Lieutenant, who I showed you on the photograph from the Ascension Island, who became a Major General. The truth is, I'll stop sharing now for a moment, if I may. Uh, the truth is, yeah, I relived it many, many times, uh, and particularly latterly, whilst I've been preparing this presentation. But for many years afterwards, for about 20 years afterwards, I had a recurring dream whereby I needed to shoot somebody in a variety of circumstances, and the gun wouldn't work. And if there are any psychiatrists out there watching this, I'd uh, welcome your interpretations of it. I think where the mental stresses are caused, in my opinion, are by two very strong, but very conflicting emotions. On the one hand, you have relief. I am very relieved that I survived that night. I had very slight physical wounds, and I don't think my mental health has been too adversely affected. So on one hand, you have relief, and then on the other hand, you have guilt. Why did I survive? Why did Corporal Lovett die next to me? What why them and not me? And so you have these emotions, which is, I'm glad I survived. Why the devil did I survive? I think what it made me do was, was, was try and live my life as positively as I could. Um, I've had a career in training and coaching, which is helping people. And that's been very, very rewarding. Uh, and in my personal life, I've got a, a fantastic family, my wife and two kids. Uh, thoroughly enjoy our, our family life and I've got many many friends and we've had some good times together and I've lived a full life and continue to do so I appreciate that I've been very very lucky in all sorts of things but I do think that the problem for other veterans who suffer a lot worse than me is this trying to reconcile the relief 
with the guilt. I'm still here. Why aren't other people here? I'll revert to the slides now. And let you know about the aftermath. And this is a quote from Jimmy's book. I'll give you a second or two to read it. Do I have my bad moments? Yes, I do. Do they take me by surprise? Yes, they do. Do I have episodes of anger? Not so much, but certainly guilt and confusion. But I still consider myself very, very lucky, both physically, there's been no after effects on my, my left arm, and mentally. Yeah. But please try and understand that I'm the lucky one. Um, within Jimmy's book, there are two quotes from various authors, and I think these say it all. In war, there are no wounded soldiers, but not all scars are visible, and not all wounds heal. I'm coming to the end now, and I just got uh, three things to say. Um, in July, I'm hoping to take over as president of the Rotary Club of Bath Haven. And uh, one of the honors of that role is that I get to choose a charity or charities that we uh, support. Uh, I've not told, uh, sorry, I've not um, decided yet on which charities I'm going to support, but they will be related to veterans and mental health. The second thing is, if after watching this, you've not had any of your questions answered and you want to discuss any issues further, then please do get in touch. And the third thing is, if you would like me to speak either on Zoom or face-to-face, -face, if that's feasible, at any other events, then I'd be happy to talk to you about it. The object of the exercise has been to raise awareness of veterans and mental health, and secondly, to raise funds. So with that in mind, if you would like to contribute, the name of the account is the Rotary Club of Bath Avon Trust Fund. Uh, certainly some people have difficulty with their banks matching the name on the account, but you can override this if you wish to. The sort code is 090155. There's the account number. And if you put my name as the reference. If you are a UK taxpayer, this begins to sound like a, a government advert. Would you be kind enough to contact my colleague, Peter Mills, on that email address? And he'll ask you to sign a form. That means we can get 25% more on your donation. If you do decide to donate, I will hereby give you my word that the funds will be spent wisely on charities supporting veterans and or mental health. The reason for that, I think, is simple. That the, the planets are coming into, into line at the moment, me becoming president of Bath Haven Rotary Club and it being the 40th anniversary of the Falklands. I'd like to take that opportunity to address the fact that veterans, in my opinion, in this country are treated dreadfully. And I'd like to try and do my little bit to address that. If you can help, I'll be immensely grateful. Thank you.